Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 117, recorded on August 4th, 2019. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. Good to be connected with you on a very busy news week. Let's start off with Manjaro's plans to ship free office. Yeah, free office, which is free as in beer, but not free as in freedom. This is a proprietary office suite, which they had initially planned to ship by default in Manjaro. But then after a fair bit of backlash, shall we say, they've decided that they're not going to ship it by default, but they'll give you the option to install it or LibreOffice or no office suite. A pretty common reaction online was negative. People thought it was a bad idea to shove a proprietary Office product into a free Linux distribution when LibreOffice exists and it's pretty functional. I had a chance to chat with Philip, one of the founders of Manjaro, on Linux Unplugged 312, and what I took away from the conversation was that it was more about trying to create a bit of differentiation for Manjaro from the rest of the pack, so there's something unique about the distribution, but also trying to improve compatibility for users that treat their office suite like a tool, and they wanted perhaps improve compatibility with the commercial products on the market, which SoftMaker's free office is pretty well known for. I think the project looked at it as a very practical move. There was no monetary exchange to take it on. It was more of a, let's just try to do something different and improve compatibility for users. The reaction was strong, and so now it sounds like it'll be an option during install. Yeah, you're going to be faced with a screen that gives you the option of either FreeOffice, LibreOffice, or no Office Suite. And I think that's what they should have done in the first place, really. I think that it was a bad idea to ship proprietary software by default. Fair enough, give people the option to install it, but I think just having that on your default ISO is just, it's its not a great look, really, for a Linux distribution. I think I agree. Making an option is best for everyone, because myself... When I install Manjaro, I'll choose the no office option. I, that's perfect <laughs> for me. I don't really want it. I don't use it that much. So th- that's that's what you know my dog in this hunt is, full disclosure. However, so I could have an informed conversation with Philip, I downloaded free office and gave it a go. And after using it for about an hour and opened up a couple of different things, compared it to LibreOffice and Google Docs, which is my, sorry to say, when I do need a word processor or spreadsheet. I use Google Docs. So I compared it to that as well. And I walked away with something, and that is good enough is not good enough for people that are opening up business documents, where they need to properly be able to import proprietary office formats and then save as different proprietary office formats and keep functionality, make sure formatting is correct, and have a workflow that's really similar. Imagine that uh, mythical migrating user who's coming from Windows to Linux FreeOffice sort of replicates that office look and feel combined with the compatibility. And in my experience, it's also faster, a little, li- little faster, a little starts up a little bit quicker, feels a little lightweight on the system. And you combine that with the look and feel and the compatibility. I think it is a solid argument that it's better than LibreOffice for a certain type of worker. So again, I think having the option at install is a good thing. Yeah, by all means, make it easy to install this proprietary office suite and point people towards it and recommend it or whatever. But I just think shipping it by default is just crossing a line. Some people talked about shipping graphics drivers by default, but I think that's different. That is making the most of your hardware, whereas this is just different. This is productivity software that we're talking about that you don't actually need to make your computer work properly. Yeah, I agree. There's not an equivalence to hardware enablement. But there could be an equivalence to Codex or making Steam super simple to install. You don't need Steam to make your computer work. You don't need H.264 playback and MP3 playback to make your computer work. It's nice to have, just like opening up Office documents that you need to interact with to do your job is nice to have. Yeah, but there is no open source version of Steam. There's no open Steam or whatever. There are different ways to get games that, that can be open source or whatever, but I, I don't think that is a fair equivalent because LibreOffice is good enough for some people, at least for me. And I use it actually quite a bit and I just have no need for a proprietary Office suite. I, I think it comes down to make it easy to install, but don't ship it by default. That's what I personally want to see. That's reasonable and I can't really argue that. 
I want to sort of pivot for a second and talk about the meta aspect of this story, which we, in a way, have touched on several times this year already, and that is outrage-driven development. Project announces intention to do X, community reacts very strongly, and then project amends announcement to do Y instead, which is generally a compromise in some way. And sometimes that truly is for the best, like in the case of the 32-bit support for Ubuntu. I am reminded of that famous Steve Job quote that's roughly, if you asked consumers before the automobile came out what they wanted, they'd say a stronger, faster horse. Yeah, I do get what you're saying there, but this is open source development we're talking about, and it's supposed to be a community effort. And okay, some people go about it in the wrong way, being too strident and, you know, Twitter rants and all the rest of it. But isn't the whole point of it that the community drives the direction of development? Absolutely. You quantified it right there. That's why I'm worried, because Twitter and the forums don't represent the tens and tens of thousands of people that are running Manjaro. Just as the people that got really upset on Twitter and the dozen or so news articles were written and the outrage comments on Reddit don't represent the tens of millions of Ubuntu desktop users. But yet what we talk about as community is just a hyper-representation of the most outraged individuals who are taking the effort to go to different outlets, some which are very low effort, like Reddit and Twitter, and they're expressing their outrage. I saw so many comments about people dropping Manjaro over this. This sort of, I want to punish them attitude for doing this. It's not just the people are upset, they want to punish them. And then the developers, who all of a sudden have this onslaught of very loud feedback, cave. Because we all see this as this is this, this is the voice of the community. When it's just the representation of a small portion. You know this because our shows have <laughs> a lot more people downloading than we get comments from. And it's just the nature of doing business on the internet. You get a lot of people that just enjoy content or will use a distribution, faithfully upgrade from re- release to release of Manjaro and be perfectly happy with it and, and not really care. You know, most people probably just figure, all right, well, if they install FreeOffice, I'll just uninstall it, and then I'll install LibreOffice. Job done. And that that's it. And end of story. And what we end up getting is this hyper-representation from the outrage. And I, that that's really what bothers me here is because that is driving decisions. And it's not fully representative of the entire community. There's not really a way to get representation from the entire community. You just have to listen to the vocal people or ignore them or whatever. They are the people who are in your community who are talking to you. And so you have to decide whether you think that they are a true representation of the silent majority or whether they're just crackpots or whatever. And that is a difficult thing to do. I think it's a skill you have to build up. I think it's something that takes perhaps years of exposure to calibrate correctly. And some personality types may be better or worse at handling that kind of feedback as well. So there's a personal factor in in there. Yeah, but it's just part of running a project. You just have to be able to deal with this stuff. Add that to the list of required skills to run a large open source project. All right, problem solved. Moving on, two other (laughs) large open source projects are coming together, perhaps, maybe, to benefit end users. Yeah, the Linux App Summit is going to be held in Barcelona in November from the 12th to the 15th. And there's going to be representatives from both KDE and GNOME all working together there. Joe, I believe this is the artist formerly known as the Libre Application Summit. But I think that was when it was more just the GNOME camp. And now that the KDE and GNOME folks are coming together to sort of talk about some future collaboration on the desktop, they've renamed it. And it's I think a pretty positive sign of where the two projects could be going in the future. And the headlines are going crazy. It's They're coming together to create a new desktop era for Linux. I don't know about that. But it seems like it's it's a good sign. And it's looking like this is the next generation or the next phase of this conference. Really, this isn't anything hugely new because the, the different projects in open source have generally worked together before. And this supposed rivalry between GNOME and KDE is just not even really true. It's the users, if anything, might be starting this. But I think that what actually stands out here is that they're going to actively start working together rather than just kind of playing nice with each other and occasionally interacting, whatever. This is going to be some serious coming together 
to improve the Linux desktop. Uh, I mean, is that pie in the sky? I don't think so. I think genuinely this is a really good move. I think the truth lies somewhere there in the middle. Like you say, uh, a lot of this has already been happening for a long time. There have been common standards efforts for years. I think what we're getting here is a bit of a sales pitch from a group that is trying to grow a conference into something that's a serious contender in the industry. And so they're using a lot of enthusiastic language. I'll give you an example. KDE and GNOME will no longer be taking a passive role in the free desktop sector. I mean, that's just that sentence right there. That reeks of sales bullshit. First of all, it's demeaning to the project's years of efforts, and it implies that they have somehow been just sitting around observing the free desktop market, but not actively participating in it, which is an insane sentence because they are the free desktop market. Uh, So it's just ridiculous on its face. And they then continue on with the joint influence of the two projects. The summit will shepherd the growth of the free desktop by encouraging the creation of quality applications. This is one of those fallacies that we run into a lot in open source development. We have this great belief, because we have seen it work a few times, a few times super successfully too. If we build it, they will come. If we build the perfect framework, if we have the ideal toolkit, if we use just the right language, they will come. That's not what drives the desktop market. I think it should be obvious and painfully clear to this group in particular that that's not the dynamics at play in the desktop market. It hasn't been for about 25 years. So a lot of this to me reads as they're really excited about this event. They hope that they can lay some foundational groundwork here to really work towards something in the future, and they need a lot of people to get on board. And so they've got to talk about it in a really big way. And the way it's being represented in the rest of the community as this incredible event of the two projects coming together while that feels good, it, it, it's, it's just a conference. <laughs> you know, it's not like some joint declaration of cooperation that the uh, foundations have issued with co-signatures of all of the primary developers. It's some event organizers that are promoting something that's happening in Barcelona in November. I thought I was supposed to be the cynical one. That's that's a very cynical read of it. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'm just much more positive. Maybe I've just swallowed the uh, the Kool Aid on this one. But I think it is. It's got to be good for them to be getting together and and working together like this. You you might be right. The, the way to really know would be to go. Right. Um, I won't be making it to Barcelona this year. But if they ever made it to the U.S. like next year or something, I'd I'd check it out and see if I'm wrong. I'd sure love to see some uh, information about how they plan to entice third-party developers. I'd like to see some action plans on how to go after the market that is creating applications that run on the cloud. That seems like such a perfect market for the free desktop groups to target. A real type of power user that's comfortable with change that needs to develop on the platform that they're targeting anyways. Oh my gosh. Like, they practically could just give them an invite. So maybe that'll come out of this conference. But uh, that might just be too practical. Maybe I'm expecting too much. Maybe. Well, Barcelona in November is lovely, so maybe I could uh, try and go. You could be our special correspondent, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good to me. (laughs) You be careful. You might get held to that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, let's talk about Android. And we got a pretty big update this week regarding search providers in Europe. I guess I was naive. I did not see it going this way. So first, it's kind of what you would expect. A real basic screen in Android that will have Google and three other search providers that you can choose from that have been randomized. Uh, Google writes, we'll introduce a new way for Android users to select a search provider to power a search box on their home screen and as the default in Chrome if it's installed. Not too surprising. But if you want your search engine to be part of this, then you're pretty much going to have to pay. Now, this is the part I should have expected but hadn't really given a thought. It's going to be an auction, Joe. To get your search engine on that list next to Google's name, you have to participate in what Google calls a first price sealed bid auction to select the other general search providers that appear on the choice screen. Google will conduct auctions on a per-country basis for a period from January 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. Following the initial round of auctions, 
any subsequent rounds will only occur once per year, which means these are high value spots. In each country's auction, search providers will state the price that they are willing to pay each time a user selects them from the choice screen in that given country. Yeah, and then each search engine is just going to get an invoice every month from Google. This is how many people wanted to use you, so you've got to pay us this much money. This really is Google just doing the absolute bare minimum to comply with the European Commission. And Google had previously argued that it needed that search revenue that was tied to results in Chrome and on the Android platform to monetize what they said was, quote, a significant investment in the system. However, the commission rejected that assessment, noting the billions Google earns in the Play Store alone, as well as all of that very valuable data that Google is collecting on Android users. But to to monetize this and to make it super exclusive once a year, and there's only three other slots along with Google's own search results. So it's going to be really expensive. <laughs> and you have to get cracking because if you want your search engine in that list, you need to apply to bid by September 13th of 2019. But what's interesting is that if you are running a search engine, you don't necessarily have to pay to be part of this because if three search engines aren't willing to pay, then any of those extra slots will just be chosen at random from a list of search providers that were interested in it but didn't want to pay. So I don't know whether that's actually going to happen. It seems capitalism will probably mean that there won't be any free slots, but it'll be interesting to see whether that actually happens. Although we won't probably hear about it because this is all kind of sealed, confidential, and that no numbers are going to be revealed to the public. It does kind of make me giggle, though, picturing Bing and DuckDuckGo, like shell corporations being set up all around the world bidding on these, so that way DuckDuckGo and Bing would be (laughs) on there. Just a big conspiracy to screw with Google. That makes me laugh. Hey, let's do a quick update on DNS over HTTPS, a.k.a. Oh! Yeah, so Mozilla are looking to implement this by default in Firefox, but before they do that, they are running some tests. When we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, I was kind of curious how this would work for managed networks like enterprises that have centralized DNS that they use for very specific reasons or parental controls. Well, it turns out Mozilla's thought of that, or at least they are thinking about that right now, and they're running a test. They want to understand how often users of Firefox are subjected to managed networks or parental control software. Um, also, a really common way to do ad blocking, right, is by DNS blocking. So they have to attempt to discover how common this is and how they can accommodate it. Selena Deckelman writes on the Mozilla blog that they'll be capturing this information locally, including when people are using safe versions of Google or YouTube, and they will analyze that, and then they'll send up the metrical information, if, they, if, you, if that's a word, to the Mozilla servers, but not the actual URLs you're going to. So this is sort of a safe way to participate in the study for them without them having to actually look at all of your DNS queries and all of that garbage that would sort of violate your privacy like crazy. And, of course, they are offering a way for you to opt out as well. I don't really know what they're planning to do with the data that they collect here, because what are they going to find out? A certain percentage of users fall into these categories, but then what? I could see a couple of uses. If it's super low, if it's like 1% of our users have managed DNS, which I doubt, but let's just say that's what it is, then that makes just a great stat in the blog where we can just completely ignore this because only 1% of our users have this problem. So it could be that, but I doubt it. I think the more generous interpretation would be they'll use this to develop the different features and support in DNS over HTTPS. So they will have to build in some types of accommodation for safe search and for managed enterprise DNS. And perhaps this will give them some insights into what areas they have to focus on. Well, right now it's pretty easy to go into the settings and enable or disable DNS over HTTPS. And I would imagine that once it is default, that's going to be similar. So I think that administrators are not going to have a hugely bad time of it. And most users will be fine. So it's going to be one more part of the setup process for people who have specific uses. I don't think it's going to be a huge issue. I started playing around with it just recently. I'm going to give it a go for a while. And I noticed now there's just a field right in there to specify your own DNS over HTTPS server. And uh, to make that a little bit easier, there's a snap now. I think it's like a, it might be called like a Cloud Cloudflare or something. It's a version of the Cloudflare 
DNS over HTTPS proxy server that you can install on your own system and run it on your own box and try it for a little bit. It could be kind of a neat way to just mess around with the whole software stack. I'll, I'll try it for a bit, see where it goes. I think the biggest question on all of our minds is, will we ever get used to saying do? I certainly won't. And DNS over HTTPS is a mouthful. We need something that's, uh, I don't know, easier to say. We need a new contract, Joe. One for the web. And I think uh, your good buddy, Tim Berners-Lee, may have just the solution. Yeah, the way he sees it, things are very different from 30 years ago when he invented the web. And he thinks that it's gone into some pretty dodgy directions. And he thinks that what we need is for everyone to sign up for this contract for the web and suddenly that's going to make everything much better. The idea is get major governments, major corporations, get everyone in between to literally sign a contract that companies and governments should ensure everyone can connect to the internet and keep all of the internet available, affordable, and accessible all the time, and respect and protect people's fundamental online privacy and data rights. Clearly something that's pretty easy to get behind. What company wouldn't want to be on that list? It looks good. <laughs> Berners-Lee goes on to describe this as a journey from digital adolescence to a more mature, responsible, and inclusive future. Is anyone going to pay attention to this? It seems pretty unlikely to me. I mean, maybe. I mean, a lot of my attention these days is really focused on solid. Yeah, whatever happened to that? That was his project to, I don't even know, know what it was supposed to be, some sort of like next generation web or something. Yeah, a new way to do linking of data. Yeah, and if you look at the website, it says the apps are coming. The first wave of solid apps are being created now. So who knows, maybe he's uh, just working on a few things at the same time, but um, uh, it just feels like he's trying to stay relevant, maybe. <sighs> maybe. Um, I'm of two minds. I do see that. It, it, it feels like these initiatives go nowhere because the the internet and the web are just not a cohesive small thing that can be influenced like that anymore. But then I also think about what people say about Richard Stallman. And uh, I, I, I'm somewhere in the middle on that, on those particular things, too. I feel like, in a way, it's good to have something to strive for. Like, what is the bar? What should we, as citizens of the Internet, be pushing for? And that's a pretty good list. I could get behind that list of ideals. I could say I'm pretty skeptical anything's going to become of this, but maybe it's good to have that, that goalpost. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Having one good force tugging in the positive direction can't really be a bad thing. So maybe I should stop being cynical. Well, and I suppose in that regard, it's good to have his name attached to it. Yeah, I suppose. And if they can get some seriously big organizations signing up to this, then maybe it can create some momentum. Now, our last story of the week. When I first saw the headline, I kind of snickered a little bit, and I thought, this is kind of silly. And then it clicked in my head how I would personally use this, and... Well, now I'm kind of excited about moving the Linux desktop into virtual reality. This may actually be a genuinely decent use case for VR on Linux. Right. Well, this I have to hear because I did not stop snickering, I'm afraid. Well, Collabra has made this announcement, and it was development that's sponsored by Valve, and there's real functional code today. Those are all three, like, unusually great things about an announcement. It's called XR Desktop. And it sits on top of either Plasma or GNOME Shell, and it extends the window environment into virtual reality, into a 360-degree space where you can manage windows in that space. Now, this is, for me, perhaps the only solution to what is otherwise an insatiable appetite for monitors that I have. I, I want so many screens, Joe, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I would like to have, if I truly could, a screen per application. Really would. So this is actually potentially a possibility because not only can you lay windows out, but because it's a full 3D space, you can have them far away. You can move them closer. There's core elements to what they're proposing, the workflow that I find super appealing. Essentially unlimited screen space in a whole virtual world. When I'm sitting here doing these shows, I could be sitting here with a VR headset on my face with Hundreds of windows. It could be paradise, Joe. I, my, I could be in ADD heaven. Sounds like a nightmare to me. I can't think of anything worse. I suffer really badly from motion sickness, and it seems to be getting worse as I get older. 
So this just, no way would I possibly want it. It's like something from an 80s movie. Like it, it just seems just laughable to me that you would want to do this. That might be why I like it too. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, f- honestly, it is so early days. This is this is really rough stuff. Um, I'm very skeptical about the interface. They've they've done a good job to map UI controls to the VR controllers. I, I got to give them credit for that. I'm not on board with using my Oculus controllers to manage my desktop, though. I want a keyboard and mouse now. There's a lot of rough stuff here, but here's what we do know so far. It integrates with the existing desktop environments compositors. In the case of KWIN, it's sort of like a Compiz plugin, if you will. And in the case of Gnome Shell, it's some patches. So you can run both the virtual space and your actual desktop environment at the same time if you want. They've written a glib wrapper to Vulkan, which they call Gulkin, which makes it easy to use Vulkan rendering for this entire environment. And they have early support even for Wayland on GNOME Shell. Now, I don't think this is going to be the future of the Linux desktop. In fact, I don't even think this is going to be a mainstream thing. But I really appreciate the idea that if you plug a VR headset into Linux in the future, there's actually something functional you can do with it. It doesn't just show up as a second weird display that has the wrong aspect ratio, and Linux just looks like a dumpster fire trying to manage it. If you plug that thing in and all of a sudden your desktop application's extended to it, like a mirrored environment, and it was functional, that's pretty impressive. And if they just got to there, I'd be a, I'd be a happy camper. Yeah, fair enough. It's not something I'm going to use, but I suppose bringing more functionality on Linux to existing hardware, that's always got to be good. This is more likely going to get me to hook up my Oculus to a Linux desktop than gaming would. I know that sounds silly, but like I say, I've just got a voracious appetite for screens. I I want all the screens. (laughs) So then actually, I was thinking, I was thinking we should do a challenge and try to get Wes to set this up for us during the sprint that we're doing in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <Wouldn't that be? laughs> Don't say anything. Don't tell anybody. We'll surprise them. Yeah. Well, get Linux Action News every single week at linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And you can go to linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. And go check out the new linuxacademy.com brand new website launch, and it looks slick. Yeah, did you have anything to do with this dark mode thing? (laughs) It's taking over, Joe. Oh, man, I love it. (laughs) We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. I'm at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Ressington. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week. See you later. (laughs) 